Good evening. Welcome to our Fall 2020 Public Event Series. I'm Milton Curry, Dean of the USC School of Architecture and the Della and Harry McDonald Dean's Chair in Architecture. And very pleased this evening to welcome Michael Maltzen uh, with us to speak uh, with us this evening for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then we'll be joined by uh, Jeffrey Von Owen, our Assistant uh, Director of our Undergraduate Programs, who will moderate a Q&A with Michael. USC Architecture is a school committed to the intellectual project of design across various architecture, design, and sub-disciplinary sub areas and knowledge domains. Housing design and housing innovation has been the lifeblood of the school's DNA for quite some time, including the period of the case study house movement and beyond. Today, we have a wide swath of our faculty whose work is innovative and socially compelling and progressive in developing new ways of thinking about housing across different scales and constituencies. Our speaker this evening, Michael Maltzen, principal of Michael Maltzen Architecture, is more than a housing architect, yet he and his firm have conceptualized and executed many innovative housing projects in Los Angeles and beyond, including the Star Apartments, New Carver Apartments, Rainbow Apartments, Crest Apartments, and many others. These projects are empowering in their aspiration to dignify the lives of their client residents, some of them formerly homeless, low wealth, and part of the workforce. Uh, these are incredible uh, efforts to make housing and architectural design of housing uh, a pathway towards uh, social dignity and social equity. Non-housing notable projects uh, by Michael Maltzen's firm include the Moody Center for the Arts at Rice University, Museum of Modern Art in Queens, and the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Inuit Art Center in Winnipeg, uh, Canada. His work has gained international acclaim for innovation in both design and construction, and has been widely featured in publications and exhibitions worldwide. Michael holds a Master of Architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, Harvard University, and a BFA and BARC degrees from the Rhode Island School of Design. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, a recipient of the American Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award. He's an award recipient uh, from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the 2016 AIA Los Angeles Gold Medal Honoree. I'm very pleased to um, have Michael with us. He's one of my favorite architects. He's become uh, a friend in the short period I've been in, in Los Angeles. I have an enormous amount of respect for him and his work and uh, just really uh, uh, want to um, present him uh, to you this evening as uh, one of LA's own. I think LA has a truly exceptional group of architects and he stands shoulder to shoulder with all of them. So Michael, welcome to our lecture series. I wish it could be in person, but we're getting the best that we can we can get here with you and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Milton. And uh, I'm glad uh, to uh, be here um, with USC tonight. Um, I wanted to um, touch on uh, uh, a project that, um, a book project first, uh, that USC played a very influential role in. Uh, in, in 2011, uh, I authored a book uh, called No More Play, which was uh, a project uh, around trying to um, get, a, get my arms around how Los Angeles was changing. Uh, and in that book, there were a number of, of different um, uh, people that I was interviewing to try to get multiple perspectives in a complex city. Uh, but uh, many of the issues that came out of that book have continued to guide my thinking about Los Angeles, my thinking about architecture uh, in general, uh, and the issues of, of the contemporary city. Iwan Bon, the photographer who has been a close collaborator uh, over the better part of, of my career, 
uh, was one of the uh, people who, in a sense, was was um, uh, one of the conversations in the in the book, uh, really a, a visual photographic conversation uh, with the ideas that we were we were exploring. Um, and some of those issues that came up in in the book uh, were uh, things that, again, still play out or are still playing out in uh, how the city is evolving. One of them is density and the challenging or the challenges that that uh, produces in an emerging um, an emerging met metropolis. Uh, it'll continue to be one of the things that absolutely defines the city as, as will real questions of community, uh, the social, political, cultural issues uh, that, uh, that define community are very much uh, the topic uh, and uh, are a place that architecture has a real role. Landscape, uh, in the city is often thought of in the most bucolic of terms. Certainly landscape um, has a significance in terms of the uh, long-term ecological and, and sustainable uh, sustainability impacts in the city, but it's also a part of our, um, our sense of ourselves. This is a city that defines itself very much, not only by building and density, but also by its relationship uh, to, to landscape. And infrastructure, of course, uh, is just as much one of the defining elements in the city, continuing to evolve and will continue to evolve as uh, the needs of infrastructure uh, continue to change. It is though, many ways, uh, our defining uh, civic form how that evolves uh, will say a great deal about not only Los Angeles's future, but also uh, how it relates and thinks about its history and its past. The range of scales in this city uh, are daunting. Uh, everything from infrastructure at the, at the largest and grandest scale uh, to the single family house uh, and very often right next to each other. Uh, managing that scale and, and trying to, to uh, uh, project, think about how that scale will not only change, but how those radical differences in scale uh, do define us and, and uh, also looking for opportunities for the way that those radical changes in scale can um, invigorate and invent in architecture uh, is something that uh, I've continued to be very interested in. Housing, as Milton mentioned, uh, is a real component of our work and um, is, is a significant component of our work in Los Angeles. While we're working on housing in other cities, uh, primarily in North America, Los Angeles is the place where, uh, and housing uh, is, is the typology where I think we've continued to um, look at a number of these, uh, these issues that grew out of uh, the No More Playbook. And, are primarily the, the project types, uh, or is primarily the project type that I want to talk about tonight. Carver Apartments is a uh, project that was built a number of years ago, right next to the, uh, the 10 freeway uh, for an organization, Skid Row Housing Trust, who we've worked with for a long time. They focus primarily on building housing for uh, formerly homeless individuals. Um, with them, uh, one of the uh, biggest roles we've had was uh, as they began to evolve their model from more of a shelter-based transitional housing model to one of permanent supportive housing, uh, which is exactly what it says it is. It's housing that uh, where, where residents, individuals have the ability to live permanently. They're not shuttling through. Uh, uh, these projects, but can live here permanently as individuals and also hopefully as part of a growing community. And also uh, these projects have supportive services uh, that are integrated into the building, whether that's mental uh, health um, help, whether those are uh, doctors, vocational training, many of the things that help and support these individuals to um, stay on their feet um, are integrated into the building, which brings a programmatic complexity uh, uh, to it. This project though was, um, was really uh, a change in 
the projects that the housing trust had been doing because uh, in the past their projects primarily were on skid row which for many years had been the heart of, of the real center of the homelessness population uh, but here they were looking to to go outside of that district and meet the problem and uh, the, the different communities uh, uh, where homelessness existed, which had already started to grow at this point, um, to be in, in a wide range of neighborhoods and districts in the city. Uh, I was also interested in this project uh, in its proximity to the 10 freeway for many reasons. Uh, but one of them was that uh, infrastructure in the city is, as I mentioned, uh, one of the, the major forms uh, in Los Angeles but all too often uh, really underperforms. It does one thing, it, it moves cars from one place to another, uh, but often has very little other positive impact uh, on the city. In a sense, it acts as a kind of monoculture. Uh, what I was interested in here was whether you could begin to uh, create a building because of its proximity that started to insinuate other connections uh, with, with the highway. Um, not so much because it was going to transform the 10 freeway uh, today, uh, but that maybe you could begin to look at different ways that relationships could get set up, almost as if they started to grow into each other. Uh, and uh, in this case, on the ground level, uh, the building was built really in similar materials um, with a series of bisecting uh, perspectives uh, that interlace through the ground floor and define the ground floor, connecting spaces on the street, the alley, and the underneath of, of the freeway uh, as a way of binding all of them uh, together. As the building starts to rise up, it's more circular in form, built out of wood construction as most of the low rise residential projects in Los Angeles are. Uh, the round shape um, had uh, a number of different attributes um, uh, on this site. Uh, it primarily though had the effect of creating the smallest facade to the highway. Uh, and the reason that was such a benefit was that the, the highway produces incredible amounts of, of noise. And one of the biggest costs of these types of projects, really of any kind of, of housing project, is the exterior cladding. If we could pull away from the highway incrementally with, uh, by the round shape, each foot you get away from uh, the, uh, the noise source, sees a commensurate drop in the decibel level. And that meant that as we, we, we continued to clad the building around the back side of, of, of uh, the facade, uh, that we could reduce some of the expense of, of, of the building. That really produced two very different plans. Uh, at the ground level, uh, with most of the common spaces, as I mentioned, there are these perspectival skewers, these views through the building that connect uh, the common areas on the ground level and the inside uh, life of the building, communal life of the building, with the streets and the alleys, uh, really the public life outside of it. As you move up through uh, into the residential floors, it becomes more of a cloister, uh, more inward looking around a central uh, open air courtyard uh, with each of the units defined as, as a kind of pie shaped uh, increment um, with subtle indentations on inside and the exterior, uh, which provided uh, uh, on the inside a small sense of threshold um, and, and uh, individuality to the unit but had an even uh, bigger effect on the exterior uh, as the uh, individual units started to be expressed in this kind of cog-like or ratcheting shape on, on the outside. That central courtyard played a real role or continues to play a real role uh, as the social and communal heart of, of the building. Uh, there are a large set of, of steps which bring you from the ground floor uh, and start to uh, create the movement up into the building, but also act as, as a type of communal amphitheater where many events take place. 
the units are all uh, open to immediately outside the door to this courtyard. So even as you come out of your unit, you get a, you get a, a chance to be a part of this, this public space. Rises up through the building. Um, and as I mentioned, is, is open to the, to the sky. Uh, the different fins, um, uh, galvanized metal fins, um, are performative. They act as uh, structural um, uh, support hangers. Uh, it's how we're bringing uh, rainwater leader, uh, leaders down through the building. There are methane vents because we had a bit of a methane um, uh, concern on the site. Uh, venting that up through the building. Uh, but they also have the effect of creating a little bit of privacy um, as you move around uh, the inside of the space. And also uh, in their slightly shiny um, surface, start to draw the light from the sky deeply down into the space. And as the daylight changes, the color uh, of the inside of, of this courtyard uh, uh, really, really uh, also starts to change with the color of the sky. So it has a very dynamic presence over the course of, of the day, the, the week, the month, and the year. <clears throat> I mentioned the spiraling movement, or at least the, the upward movement that begins with the steps at the ground level. That continues up and there are some programmatic spaces up higher in the building at the very top. Uh, there's an outdoor porch uh, where people can hang out and look um, back towards the city. But maybe one of the most important spaces is in the mid-level on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, which is the TV common room and also the laundry room. And these seem like very pragmatic spaces, very prosaic spaces, but they're also spaces that uh, the people who are the residents in the building use all of the time. They're, they're really one of the most important social spaces uh, for uh, impromptu and informal meetings within the community of the building itself. We placed uh, uh, those spaces very consciously on the third floor, which is exactly at the same level as the highway. And even though this image looks like um, traffic is moving quite quickly all the time, as anybody who lives in Los Angeles knows, it isn't always. And there are often moments uh, throughout the day where people moving along the highway, which is in many ways uh, our main street or one of the main streets in the city, get the opportunity to uh, see the community and vice versa inside the building. It's not a moment that will completely change uh, the uh, separation between uh, individuals who were homeless, um, who are living in the building, and people um, who are driving by on the highway. But it's a beginning. It's a, it's a moment where the architecture tries to uh, help start create that relationship. The, uh, one of the later projects that we worked with the trust, the, the Skid Row Housing Trust on, it's a project called Star Apartments. This was completed a few years ago. And it's actually back really right on the edge of, of Skid Row. Interestingly, right at the threshold between what most people define as, as, as Skid Row and uh, the towers and cultural institutions um, of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, they're really in, in extremely close proximity. Star Apartments uh, is 102 units uh, and is in many ways one of the most ambitious projects uh, that we have done with the Housing Trust. It was taking on uh, issues of density, um, adaptive reuse, and uh, one of the first uh, prefab, well, really the first multifamily prefabricated uh, project in the city in, in 50 years. Uh, the the, the building um, uh, takes at the ground level what was an existing uh, one-story uh, retail building. Uh, the trust had wanted to make a ground floor um, uh, mixed use building uh, for, for many years. Uh, for a lot of reasons that was very difficult, but finding a building that had uh, that uh, retail use already and, and repurposing it uh, adaptively reusing that building to maintain a more retail frontage uh, was a real goal uh, and a real change in the way that um, uh, 
the majority of their buildings had been developed. Uh, and that becomes the podium upon which uh, the rest of the building is really um, uh, stacked. Density was a, an enormous issue, as I mentioned here. We were trying to create as many units as possible on this site. And uh, in, in this project, uh, the, the form of, of the building isn't uh, only uh, perimeter, units at the perimeter with, as we did in, in Carver Apartments, uh, courtyard in the middle, there are units even within the body of the building. This might not seem so radical in a city like, like Tokyo, Sao Paulo, uh, but in a city like Los Angeles, the idea of this kind of, of density um, uh, was, at, especially at this, this uh, time, um, extraordinarily um, uh, different than especially uh, the building department, and many of the um, uh, oversight agencies were uh, accustomed to. So there was a real, um, there was real work here, not only in the design of the architecture, but the, um, the conversations uh, with many of the agencies to even conceptualize a project which had that kind of density. And that really uh, simultaneously was a part of the work around prefabrication. Uh, I'm not gonna get into it, uh, at the moment, the, the particulars. Um, but the way that uh, the city had defined prefabrication, multifamily prefabrication, made it very difficult uh, for any developer to imagine using that technique. Here, it was uh, a real benefit because we were trying to create, as I mentioned, great density. The site was very compact. There wasn't a lot of places, there weren't a lot of places to stage construction. Uh, and we were trying to build the building as quickly as possible, which led us to prefabrication as a potential technique. All of the units, because there is no prefabrication or there hadn't been in Los Angeles, we had to reach very far for a manufacturer going to Boise, Idaho uh, to make the units, which were then all trucked um, to Los Angeles and stacked. But it was remarkable once the stacking of the units did, uh, did occur because all of the units were placed on the site in under four weeks, which is, is really quite uh, significant. In that in-between layer, uh, between that ground floor existing building, which we re reclad, reskinned, um, we needled down through structurally, creating a new structural tray uh, up above that then the units were, were stacked on top of. But it allowed us to create this layer at the second floor, uh, which took the um, place of the courtyard as the significant space for, for the growth of, of real community. And here uh, on, that, on that ground level, um, we imagined a kind of microcosm of, of diverse communal uh, programs. Everything from a community kitchen, outdoor community garden, uh, recreation areas, uh, yoga um, uh, and uh, strength um, uh, uh, areas on the outside uh, for classes to take place, uh, vocational uh, classrooms, art classrooms, outdoor half court basketball uh, and a jogging and walking track that surrounded uh, that entire space. In that way, um, the, the uh, that second floor of, of the building almost became a kind of outdoor park, uh, but, but underneath the building, which in this view, this is before the basketball court actually went in, it's quite tall space, uh, shows the rawness of the building, but also maybe the connection to um, uh, an idea of repurposing um, the forms of infrastructure. Um, where the scale can, can start to be um, rethought and, and reused for, for other functions um, in the city. One of the most recent projects that we completed, uh, the most uh, recent uh, completed project with the Skid Row Housing Trust is called Crest Apartments, 64 units, uh, but in a very different location, in this case, in the more suburban uh, sprawl of, of the valley in Van Nuys. Uh, this is a, a, a continuation of the Housing Trust's goal to reach out into the city and not isolate um, uh, 
the response to homelessness in one district. Uh, but in fact, uh, to mix it into the um, uh, to the uh, full life of, of Los Angeles and the sprawling metropolis. The site um, really is a kind of bridge between a number of different um, uh, typical, uh, typical kinds of, of landscapes and buildscapes in the city. Um, immediately adjacent to the building on one edge is uh, long strip boulevard, quintessential uh, strip boulevard in Los Angeles. On the back edge is a, a typical neighborhood of single family residences. Uh, in the far uh, left hand, upper left hand portion of the photograph um, is a light uh, industrial manufacturing area. Um, you can obviously see the hills and mountains of the San Gabriel Mountains off in the distance. And then uh, not very far away is a tributary into the Los Angeles River, which is a part of obviously the um, ongoing conversation about uh, water use and um, the impact and, and rethinking of, of the rivers and the creeks that feed into it as attributes in the city. Uh, along this, this boulevard, uh, if there is housing, much of it is a low one or two story um, uh, buildings that you typically see uh, in the suburban um, uh, outlying uh, areas of, of the city. But in, in, in uh, Crest Apartments, we were starting to try to imagine um, a building that maybe had a more vertical character, um, uh, partially because of the density we were trying to build here, uh, but to also rethink uh, the relationship uh, in the presence of these buildings um, out on, on the street. Those, those, those low buildings um, that define much of multifamily housing in, uh, in a lot of Los Angeles uh, are often, uh, often look like this. Uh, buildings that have been um, described or often called them dingbat apartments. Uh, one to two stories of residential uh, above what is more or less uh, all parking on the ground floor. Um, the ground floor really being given over to the car, which obviously was more ubiquitous um, throughout the history of Los Angeles. But uh, in, in our project, uh, the car plays a much um, less significant role because of, of the community that, that lives and the residents that live in this building. But I also think the reality is, is that the car is gonna to continue to play less and less of a role uh, in um, our lives and in housing in Los Angeles um, as we continue to evolve into the future. And that means that the typologies of things like the dingbat apartment might be able to be rethought or repurposed. Um, here I thought uh, we could in a way uh, change uh, repurpose the space of the car on the ground floor uh, to really remake more of a garden, um, but a garden that had uh, also the ambition to be a place uh, that was a very um, uh, pervious landscape that would allow the capture of rainwater um, on the site and to allow that, that water to continue to uh, percolate back into, into the aquifer. The building is organized more as a double loaded corridor uh, with this slightly uh, um, arcing shape uh, that had, uh, that came from a very pragmatic concern, um, which is we had to get a fire truck into the middle of the site uh, with enough room to turn around. So we almost, uh, in, in a lot of ways, bent the building around that, that truck turning radius, but it had a benefit. Uh, which is that it started to create different uh, pockets of, of and different scales of landscape of the building. So at times, the building almost feels like it's floating um, in, this, uh, in this garden. The units, as I mentioned, are organized around a double loaded corridor. There's two unit types, um, in each case, uh, trying to uh, create a, a larger feeling um, to the units, which... Uh, uh, are all about the same scale, 350 or so square feet. 
um, the corridor is open air in that it's not conditioned space. Uh, and it's also wider than you would normally find in an apartment building on purpose. And then the stepping of the plan uh, takes advantage uh, of, of, of that wider corridor by creating these nodes um, uh, at each of the steps that in some cases are wider still, creating areas uh, where as people are moving through the building, they get a chance to maybe run into each other, pause for a moment and start to, uh, again, in, in, in more informal ways, uh, build community um, one or two or three conversations at a time. Uh, the building has uh, a number of different apertures at, at, at ground floor and up, up through the building uh, where you're able to see out um, to the surrounding landscape, sometimes just through small glimpses uh, of the backyard or a surrounding um, neighbor's, uh, neighbor's landscape. Color plays a heavy role in this project as it has in many of our, our, our buildings. I think of color really as a material, uh, uh, creating different tones, um, uh, different um, uh, appearances to the building. Um, uh, also um, uh, using color to uh, mix with the daylight um, as it transitions throughout the course of the day. So that at times, for instance, in, in the middle image that's yellow, uh, at the top of the page, only one of the walls is painted yellow, but the um, way the sun reflects off of that creates a second tone, a second cast of that color, uh, so that the, um, the building feels very lively over the course of the day. Ground floor, as I mentioned, is, is given over largely to communal spaces and landscape. There is some parking, although that, that those parking spaces are really uh, are a mix of, of uh, permeable um, and uh, 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 turf-like blocks that planting can grow up through. And the planting has really continued to take over um, uh, that entire ground floor. This is fairly early in um, just after the building was opened, uh, much of the landscape has started to grow even under the building now. But I think here you get a sense of, of the ambition of the building um, as something which almost levitates over this more continuous um, uh, communal landscape that is for the people who live here, but also is something which can be seen by uh, the people in the community that surround this building so that it starts to uh, play a role in, in their lives uh, over the course of the day. A more recent project uh, that we're involved in is right on Wilshire Boulevard in MacArthur Park. This is a, a, a building which is more market rate, um, uh, a more market rate um, project, uh, but uh, um, sits in a, um, a, a part of the city which is undergoing uh, a lot of pressure, certainly a lot of development pressure. Um, MacArthur Park, I think, is defined um, in some ways by two very different characters. On the right-hand side, uh, 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 extremely lively, vibrant uh, commercial um, uh, life on the street. At the same time, the park uh, has played a role traditionally um, as one of the important landscape spaces, uh, one of the important communal spaces uh, in the city. Uh, our site is, is just down from MacArthur Park between downtown and the park itself. Um, and I was also conscious of, of Wilshire Boulevard as having a long history uh, as, as one of the quintessential streets, um, quintessential boulevards in the city marked by a series of point towers uh, that were largely developed um, at the time when people, when the car had such a huge presence and those, those towers created real identity um, along Wilshire Boulevard, but they've really become part of the char uh, character and characteristics of that street. Our project is going to be built as a, a fairly uh, traditional, again, six story building, five floors of wood, one story of concrete. And while it's lower, uh, I thought that it was important to begin to relate to, or at least try to uh, uh, 
capture some of, of the quality of these towers that define Wilshire Boulevard. And in, in our project, um, the building is, has really two very different sides. Um, on the Wilshire Boulevard, Boulevard side, uh, the forms of the apartments uh, 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 come out almost as a series of towers from the center of, of, of the site. Um, it's a line or create a line of these, these um, uh, different identities, different tower identities uh, along the street. Towards the rear of the site, along the alleyway, uh, the building takes on more of a, a kind of bar or wall uh, against which uh, these, these towers are foregrounded. That creates two very different um, views, two very different aspects. Um, on the left is the Wilshire Boulevard um, uh, side with the, uh, with the towers as they move back and forth along the plane of, of, of the street all ground floor retail um, uh, opening up to, to the street. And then along the back, uh, more of a, a, a texture um, of these alternating windows in a more tight um, uh, alleyway facade. The plan uh, is, is really defined uh, by these different tower elements, uh, especially uh, towards Wilshire Boulevard. Um, the units are, are larger and span from the corridor towards the back um, all the way out to the front of the site. That means they have both frontages to um, the street, but they also have uh, views and um, uh, uh, open up to these side yards. Um, in many ways, very um, compact uh, and tighter, more dense um, side yards, which are maybe unusual um, in multifamily projects in Los Angeles, but are quite familiar in single family uh, suburban developments where you have a front yard, a backyard, but you also have these, these side yards uh, that are part of um, your landscape. And here we were thinking that the space in between might really be given over uh, to landscape. Um, so that these tighter uh, spaces between the towers start to become vertical gardens. Um, and that is really the way the project is being developed. Uh, these are common spaces um, that are open to anybody in any of the residents in the building. Uh, the individual units look out to them and the landscape starts to grow up through them, uh, eventually becoming part of a series of, of roof gardens and roof terraces. Scale in housing uh, uh, and what scale is appropriate in the city, especially a city that's changing as much as Los Angeles is, uh, has been very much um, on my mind. Uh, we completed a project a few years ago, um, uh, one Santa Fe, which is in the arts district, which at the time uh, was an area that uh, had some artists lofts uh, in a series of moderately sized buildings. Um, a lot of uh, parking lots that were about to be developed, potentially. Um, CyArk, which everybody knows, is uh, one of the um, important architecture schools and institutions in the city. Uh, and uh, railroad tracks and the LA River, very long uh, pieces of, of linear pieces of, of the um, uh, LA infrastructure. Our site was uh, an old portion of the rail yards, which is why it was so long and thin. Uh, and we were uh, capitalizing on that uh, by also trying to create a building which was not only occupying the building in a linear uh, way, um, but, uh, but also started to um, uh, relate to some of the long linear uh, uh, forms of buildings, bridges, and infrastructure around it. Uh, here, you, you start to see the building feeling like um, it's palimpsested. Uh, 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 almost on to um, the two-story uh, plinth of, of Cyark, um, which 
which starts to relate to an earlier project I mentioned, Star Apartments, where you can begin to see the city growing not so much as individual buildings on, on brand new sites, but maybe one strategy to develop in the city is to layer uh, instead. The scale of the building is such that uh, it's, it's almost uh, too large to be thought of um, as an arc, or the typical way we think of architecture as a separate discrete object. Um, the building, uh, as we were developing it, um, I kept thinking that it was blurring the line between almost urban design because of its scale and architecture, which is a, a, a scale in the city uh, that I think is very important, very interesting as the city continues to evolve and develop. Of course, um, we have a horizontal city. Our scale is not um, uh, vertical in the way many uh, cities are, uh, but um, uh, the, the buildings um, as they, in their, their horizontal scale, can still be maybe um, large enough that they, 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 they start to uh, change or redefine the way that we think of the city and the way that these other towers uh, redefine the skyline. Um, interestingly, as you get further, as you're further away from the city, there are moments when the building almost starts to um, blur into the landscape, into the grain of, of the foreground and the background. Um, the building starts to occupy this, this in-between, this middle ground that I find very, very interesting, uh, where it, it's not so clear whether it's, it's uh, uh, an individual building or it's a, really a part of the texture of, of the surrounding city. I mentioned that uh, the, um, the building was really developed or thought about uh, as, a, as a series of layers. Um, and that's true programmatically as well. At the ground level, uh, the building has about 80,000 square feet of retail space. Um, with some parking underground uh, on the southern portion of it where the site is wider. But on the northern portion of the site where uh, the site was quite thin and we backed up against a series of maintenance buildings uh, for the um, transit authority, uh, we couldn't uh, build housing right up against those, uh, those buildings. So instead we have two floors of, of parking uh, that are above ground and then um, spanning across all of that uh, are 440 units of, of, of housing that stretch about a quarter of a mile from the First Street Bridge uh, almost down to the Fourth Street Bridge. Even with this scale, uh, buildings in Los Angeles are still really built with a construction technique that has largely grown out of, of uh, the large scale wood frame construction techniques uh, developed in, in suburban development um, in many of the uh, spec home uh, developments in and around the city and out even further in, in the surrounding regions of LA. Uh, and that's a, that I, I, I think presents a, um, a significant complexity to, to the way that uh, one needs to think about uh, the scale of, of these projects. But one advantage in, in bringing the parking up into the second and third level for, that you can see in the right-hand side is that at some point, as the car starts to become less, again, ubiquitous in the city, uh, potentially there'll be uh, extra space um, unutilized in those, those, those parking lots. And by building parking above ground, which seems like a, an unusual thing to do um, uh, in the city, most times we try to suppress it and put it out of, out of uh, mind, out of view. It, it gives us the opportunity um, over time to begin to repurpose uh, that parking as it is used less and less into uh, potentially additional housing, which then fronts, fronts the street. Uh, the building, um, uh, as I mentioned, is, is very long, spans, um, uh, quite a ways from north to south, um, but is punctuated by a series of, of, of these more um, individual uh, moments that relate to the context around it, whether it's the end of, of, um, of, of, 
uh, Third Street um, lining up with the spiraling ramp of, uh, of the parking where the large gateway, the bridge uh, portal uh, outside of Sci Arc um, into what is a multi-purpose space of parking and also um, uh, common and, um, and community space. Uh, there's, um, there was in this project the idea uh, constantly that um, it would continue to evolve with the city. This big gateway and portal is there because uh, eventually the MTA is anticipating a new red line station uh, just to the east of, of the building. Uh, and this would become a station stop and, and the bridge over um, this space would start to become a gateway or portal uh, between that uh, transit. Uh, stop and, and the uh, arts district as a whole. The units inside the building uh, have, have great variety, everything from small micro units, uh, what more typical one, two bedroom units to quite large multi bedroom units. The goal being that affordability in the building could be thought of in multiple ways. Um, it does have a 20% um, uh, portion of the building, which were, it was designated uh, as affordable housing. That's not, um, there's no particular part of the building where that 20% is located. It's really spread throughout uh, the entire, entire building. All of the units, whether they're affordable or market rate are very much the same. But, but here we were trying to create the greatest diversity of unit um, scales so that uh, uh, there were many different uh, ways in which somebody could live here. Uh, an individual, uh, one, two bedroom for families, but some of the large multi-unit bedrooms, for instance, a four bedroom unit, had the possibility of uh, gathering a community, um, uh, a, almost a kind of co-living um, uh, apartment uh, type uh, where you could spread uh, the cost of, of the unit across a number of individuals, maybe three, four, up to eight individuals could live in, in those units. When uh, we were developing the project and planning the project, um, one of the things that, uh, one, of, one of the aspects of the project uh, was to begin to imagine, along with some groups like Friends of the Los Angeles River, uh, but city planning or uh, city planning department was to imagine how uh, the building might anticipate uh, connections to uh, the river over the railroad tracks. While these bridges uh, that we developed um, uh, as a representation or a kind of rendering of what that might be like probably won't be the way that uh, the um, uh, eventually the city grows over the railroad. It was a way of starting to start the conversation. And that anticipation uh, of the way the city is gonna to continue to evolve, I think is very important for architects uh, to, um, to make one of their responsibilities. The city is going to continue to grow. When this building was built, uh, there was a lot of criticism that I heard course, uh, about the building being too large, being out of scale for the arts district. And if you believe that the arts district was going to remain the same or the city was going to remain the same um, with, with no other development, then those, that criticism was probably correct. But as we've seen in the arts district, the city has continued uh, to densify. Uh, open space has continued to be developed into commercial and, and residential uses. And, and in that aspect, uh, I don't think the scale of this building uh, is really uh, out of scale at all. In fact, uh, I, we were anticipating uh, really it being at the scale of the development of the city in 20 or 25 years. And the thing that has, if anything, has surprised me, it's been uh, that uh, the scale of the city has, has met the scale of this building much, much faster than I had anticipated. Really brings us to um, the role of, of infrastructure, maybe the architect's uh, role, landscape architect's role in, in thinking about 
the role of infrastructure and how it might evolve as the city is changing. Uh, a number of years ago, we won with um, large uh, infrastructure engineering firm HNTB uh, uh, and landscape architect Hargraves uh, Associates. Um, the contract to uh, the commission to um, uh, redevelop or, or make a new Sixth Street Bridge. The Sixth Street Bridge, which you see in these images, um, played uh, a huge role. It was one of the, the real iconic structures in Los Angeles. Uh, it was one of a, a group of bridges that was built as a part of the City Beautiful movement um, by the city engineer, Merrill Butler, uh, over a number of years in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the Sixth Street Bridge was in many ways one of the most um, visible, iconic, and, and really largest and longest of all of those bridges. It needed to be uh, uh, demolished because it had um, uh, a, uh, a long-term um, deficiency in its concrete that uh, only got worse and worse with time and was gonna be a problem seismically um, in the future. And the city asked as a part of the brief, uh, in, for the new design to um, uh, imagine a new icon in the city, which is in many ways very, I think, a uh, tall task uh, to imagine uh, a structure doing that from the beginning. Um, what, what I thought was that um, the, the role of the bridge was changing. It wasn't so much just about cars crossing from one side or, or about simply the crossing of the river itself. Um, but, but really the knitting, it had the possibility to knit together uh, a whole series of different districts that had continued to grow up in this area of the city. Certainly uh, Boyle Heights and, and East Los Angeles uh, and, um, and the vibrant community, communities that, that, um, that live there. Uh, the arts district and downtown, which has continued to uh, change uh, radically. Our thinking about the LA River um, uh, has continued to evolve and the flats uh, that are adjacent to the river have also uh, continued to, to really evolve. I, I was thinking that maybe you could uh, uh, think about the original two arches over the river that were really the iconographic features of the Sixth Street Bridge, maybe multiply those into this ribbon of arches um, that, that started to uh, connect the two sides and touch down on the landscape. Um, through a series of stairs and ramps uh, so that the bridge was connecting uh, not only from one side to another horizontally, but was also connecting the different levels and layers of the city uh, vertically. Here you can see uh, an image of the bridge from Boyle Heights back to the city uh, as, as the arches um, uh, step over uh, the uh, 101 freeway, the five freeway, number of the railroad tracks, uh, and eventually the river over to the arts district. Uh, all along um, the length of, of the bridge, which is close to three quarters of a mile long, uh, we've imagined a series of spaces that are really public spaces um, that are part of this overall development. On the arts district side, uh, there's a new large uh, plaza which is being developed that will connect under the railroad tracks to the river. Uh, this is meant to be um, uh, really an arts related uh, performance community and gathering uh, space for uh, impromptu, but also large and scheduled uh, uh, events um, as they hopefully roll back out um, over the coming years. Uh, there is a development which is, is continuing to take place in, in the flats east of, of the river. Uh, and the bridge plays a real uh, role through a number of, again, the, the um, stair connections and the bicycle connections, knitting um, these smaller alleys and, and different businesses and, and communities that are growing up there up to the bridge and connecting them east and west into the city. On the eastern portion of, of uh, really the largest portion of, of the site, there's a new park which is being developed. Um, uh, as I mentioned, Hargraves Associates uh, uh, 
uh, as landscape architects uh, are really driving um, this garden that uh, has many different aspects of it that will be about recreation, uh, both passively and, um, and in very active, active ways. And here you begin to get a sense of, of the stairs climbing up over the arches and the, um, the ramping uh, for the bicycles that will uh, connect uh, the, the ground plane um, up, to, uh, up to the bridge deck. When the city uh, asked in the brief for the project uh, to take on the role of icon in the city, as I mentioned, that was quite daunting. Um, and I was trying to imagine uh, how the bridge might play that role um, beyond just the form uh, of, of the architecture. Of, of the bridge. And I, I began to think about other iconographic, uh, iconic structures in other cities, uh, certainly the St. Louis Arch, um, Statue of Liberty, the Eiffel Tower. These are all incredible icons in the city. And, and at one level, um, they're iconographic because they all do a similar thing. They're all something that you can stand back from, you can take a photograph of, and you, you can put it on a postcard or send it to somebody and they immediately know where you are, what city uh, you're in. They stand for the city. But I think just as importantly, when I started to look at each of those structures, one of the things I realized was that there are also places that you can go into, up into, and turn back and see the city around you. And the role of, of, of those those um, structures and what I hope becomes the role of the Sixth Street Bridge is that it's as much an observatory. Uh, it's certainly a, a, a form, an architectural um, infrastructural uh, element of the city that uh, hopefully will contribute to the visual uh, uh, form and landscape and aesthetic of the city. Uh, but maybe more importantly, it's a, a structure that uh, you can come to and uh, as an individual, and even more importantly, as a community or as a series of communities and look back over the city, uh, seeing how it's continuing to evolve, uh, develop uh, and, and uh, give you a, um, a connection to the emerging city uh, that uh, starts to cement uh, a stronger sense of responsibility um, and your presence uh, and role and, and place um, in that larger city. Bridges, as many of you know, is, is ongoing um, and, uh, and uh, um, its form is, is very much, very much uh, emerging as the city itself is. I want to thank Milton again and, um, and USC for uh, in, inviting me, um, uh, for USC uh, being a real sponsor um, of No More Play in a number of years ago, uh, in helping to, uh, to launch a series of ideas. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I have great gratitude um, because it's, those are ideas which I've, I've uh, been able to continue to uh, explore and as I mentioned at the beginning have continued to define many of the projects um, that I've done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Michael that was fantastic. Um, that was so so great. Um, I wanted to encourage everyone who's who's uh, watching the lecture if you have some questions you'd like uh, to have answered to go ahead and uh, add them to our Q&A in the Zoom. I just wanted to say, uh, Michael, it, one of the really wonderful things about this and just on a personal level is working on the lectures series this year and getting to close out tonight with, with your lecture. Uh, I've been a fan of your work for a long time and before I had the pleasure of teaching with Amy Murphy at USC, I remember you teaching at the GSD when I was there. I remember your uh, show that uh, Hashem Sarkis curated. Uh, I remember 
coming back to LA and working for, for Frank and hearing all about your work. I remember in being part of the LA Forum and one of the first events was your uh, being honored at Inner City Arts and sort of tracking your career for so many years and seeing what you've been doing um, and seeing the role you've played in the architecture of Los Angeles has been nothing short of remarkable. Um, when you talk about your work and you talk about scale and the impact that your work has had through the years um, or the impact that we, that we all certainly see in the work, um, it's absolutely stunning to me how some of the projects uh, quite small from a lot of the single family residences uh, that weren't part of this lecture uh, to the uh, scale of um, one Santa Fe or uh, th that type of urban uh, infrastructural work and now the bridge. Um, I wanted to get your opinion a little bit about, about what is the scale of housing in LA and the new communities in, in LA and, that, and the idea of how, how these typologies have evolved since the dingbat that you brought up. You know, that we had that the dingbat as the ubiquitous uh, housing typology that that was around LA and now we've got this really wide scale from the very micro uh, surgical ADUs in the backyard to this urban scale of work. Um, do you see this kind of wide ranging scale of, of housing continuing like this? Do you see it expanding? Do you see this more of the urban infrastructural scale of housing intervention? Do you see it uh, more localized surgical. How, how do you see that well uh it's um i hope uh that there continues to be um that wide range of scale to uh approaches uh to housing really building in general in los angeles but but housing uh specifically especially um the reason for that is certainly um I don't, but it, it's um, it's not new news that there is uh, an extraordinary need for a significant amount of housing to be built way beyond the scale of anything uh, we're doing in in the city in private or public development or nonprofit development. Uh, that needs to continue. That effort needs to continue to be ramped up. Um, promoted and um, just expanded. Uh, but I also believe that uh, that it would be a mistake to imagine that the only way of dealing with that would be, for instance, to do large scale, um, large scale projects around housing. Uh, the city is too diverse, number one, uh, uh, to necessarily accommodate that. Uh, and secondly, I believe that uh, the real invention, uh, the continued evolution of, of, of different housing prototypes and approaches uh, can take place at many, many different scales. I'd like to see um, that range of scale continue because uh, I believe that it, it provides the greatest opportunity to rethink um, ways in which uh, housing can have an influence. Uh, it provides the greatest opportunity for architects of all different uh, experiences and size of offices to uh, have, have an influence um, and uh, to um, continue to uh, make Los Angeles a hotbed of of real innovation, um, yeah. you see it in the ADUs. I think that's it, it's such an important development um, to imagine how a small increment repeated again and again and again uh, uh, can have a big impact, but also demonstrate enormous diversity of approach and and prototype. You know, another question that I had that I've been thinking about seeing the work is just uh, the truly beautiful marriage of your background in the arts and in that uh, you just see it in terms of composition and 
color and light. And, it's, and the projects are stunningly beautiful uh, objects, uh, formally, spatially, sculpturally. Um, and on one hand, you're doing this. And on the other hand, these projects, the number of the projects you've shown um, are for uh, folks who would most likely least be able to access uh, what we would think of as, as luxury or, or art, to sort of buy that type of, of art or experience or high design. And one of the things that is so commendable about your work is that you're bringing that uh, beauty um, to uh, almost transitional housing, et cetera. How, how do you deal with the issue of designing these really beautiful buildings and in a housing, in a real estate market like Los Angeles, where things are so valuable, they continue to increase in value. And the work that you're doing, uh, homeless transitional housing is more beautiful and, and, and spatially and architecturally more valuable than so much of the, the, the kind of uh, market rate or higher end housing. How, how, do, how do we think of things such as gentrification and how do we think about um, you know, accessibility of, to, to housing and uh, when you're, you're doing these absolutely beautiful projects that are, um, you know, clearly going to have a market value that's, that's going, to, going to far exceed the, the intended users. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of complexity uh, in, um, in the issues that, that you just talked about, you described. Um, it's a very complex uh, set of issues, but underneath it all, uh, I, I believe that housing, no matter what type uh, and no matter uh, which community it's serving is fundamentally a part of the city. It's a part of our larger city and I believe we have a responsibility, not just as architects, um, but quite literally as citizens, to demand that anything that gets built in our cities is at the very highest level, uh, that it makes a contribution. Um, y you, can, you can argue over what, what that contribution is, and, and certainly there are many um, different attitudes and ideas and arguments around, around style and and types of buildings. But ultimately, uh, 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 buildings that have real ambition um, and real ambition not only for themselves as a, as a piece of architecture, but ambition for their role in the city um, is, I believe, bringing, uh, the, bringing value to all of us, um, to the much larger community. At the level of the, you know, with, with many of the housing trust um, projects, we've also seen a real effect on uh, the, the community that lives there, um, a real sense of pride um, uh, with the community that lives there. And um, that, has, that has very positive effects on that community uh, and how that community relates to the community that surrounds it, the city as a whole. Architects have a capacity uh, that is quite unique. Um, that capacity starts in architecture school. Um, many of the students that I imagine are listening today, uh, tonight to this lecture, are in the beginnings of, of growing that capacity to uh, take on very complex problems, very complex challenges, uh, and bring form to a, a response to that, uh, that balances um, the very best of aesthetics uh, with the uh, significant pragmatic needs and will eventually understand um, the, the budgetary parameters of the projects. Um, that ability to take all of that information and produce something that is really makes a contribution, has real ambition. Uh, I think that 
is both a, 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 um, a rare skill set, but it also places a real responsibility, I think, on architects to exercise that skill set. Well, <clears throat> certainly the balance of, of all of those different, uh, those different needs uh, is, is hugely evident in, in your work. So that's, um, I think, a wonderful thing you bring up to students, what, uh, what they can learn so many things from, from seeing that. And uh, once again, just so grateful that you're here um, sharing that work with them. I, uh, I would like to get to some of the student questions and, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what they're, what's on their mind. And um, maybe I can just go through and look at some of the things that they're asking about and, and you could speak to them. Uh, I'll do my best to try to string this together in some sort of coherent way, but it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a random random playlist here of, of questions. Um, I'm seeing two questions that are coming in that are actually similar in nature. They're talking about um, they're talking about the aesthetics of the projects. Um, they're talking about um, the use of color, uh, the materiality, the facades. Um, they're wondering about, um, I think they're wondering about um, the use of white uh, in the buildings. They're wondering about the, the use of the other colors you bring into the building and about the relationship to site or context, um, uh, the relationship with um, uh, different uh, communities uh, that they're in and different um, uh, I think there's also yeah culture cultural context uh, within there, um, so the kind of relationship between the buildings and the site and the materiality and the colors and what your um, what your opinion of that is. Uh, the uh, when I started uh, earlier on um, uh, doing projects. Um, I was fortunate to uh, be able to work on um, projects that were in the city that were more um, uh, more institutional uh, types of projects, uh, but often they had uh, very very uh, tight budgets. Um, for instance, a project. One of the very first projects that I did, Inner City Arts, which is in the Skid Row uh, part of, again, neighborhood in, in Los Angeles, was a project where um, I, I had real ambitions, but, uh, but we also had a very, again, very tight budget. And I was trying to imagine um, uh, how to make an architecture from that. Um, and I was at, at the time in, in my career uh, in, in architecture, uh, there were a lot of projects being built where I felt that the form, the program um, were not really responding, the spaces were not really responding um, to the context and communities, but they were, uh, they had very strong presences primarily by um, the extraordinary use of or reinvention of materials um, that they were taking on. And I became very suspicious of that because I felt that uh, uh, that idea that architecture was defined by um, often the fanciness, for lack of a better term, <laughs> of its materials um, was not allowing the architecture to really get at um, some some of the fundamental aspects of the, of, of um, what architecture could do, or what I thought its responsibilities were. So I decided I started to take on started to use materials that were very prosaic and ubiquitous in the city. For instance, white stucco plaster. It's everywhere. It's been around. Um, certainly since the early adobe uh, days in the city. It's used in every kind of inexpensive building. It's used in every kind of building in the city. 
uh, and almost any contractor knows how to put it on. Um, I like that material because uh, it had, a, in the end, it had some qualities that I felt um, uh, were things that I could really begin to work with. Um, one was that it was a very fluid material. Uh, you could shape it in, in uh, fairly easy ways. Um, secondly, it started to capture uh, the light um, in ways that uh, I found very interesting. I've been fascinated by the characteristics of the light in not only Los Angeles, but many of the cities that we work in. And uh, the, the, the blank white canvas of the, um, of the plaster would take on and, or takes on the way that light changes over the course of, uh, as I mentioned in some of the other projects, the course of the day, um, the course of the year, uh, and really starts to reflect the characteristics of the place, um, which for me is a, a, a maybe a deeper, more nuanced way of talking about the situation that a building is in as opposed to the more formal contextual relationships that you might you might make. Um, color evolved out of that uh, because we still had tighter budgets in the beginning uh, and something as um, simple as paint um, could be used in ways that um, really changed the appearance, the form uh, of, of the projects. And I started to think of color really as a material, as having many of the same effects that you might uh, uh, use other, another range of materials, brick and wood and whatever for, um, to define shape and form. Um, Perception, perception of space. You can go back to the early modernists and see them using um, uh, color in in ways that uh, I think our work um, certainly owes some debt to. Uh, people think of yep. Corb's work as all being white because it was mostly represented in black and white photographs, but in fact, we know it had incredible polychromy. Um, I see our work really growing out of that um, that tradition as well. Okay. You know, what, one of the one of the questions was about: Is this, you know, these ordinary ubiquitous materials, these typical ways of building in LA, are they are they worthy of of study? Of this? Should students be looking at this? Should they be? Should this be something? You know, how, how should how should the the academy treat that how should how should we be thinking about this this type of thing students should we say look this is this this palette of materials that we have um we should be doing something with that you're also doing the prefabricated work like star apartments um you know should we where where should the where should the schools be be looking in the sense that students uh in los angeles at usc um, what what do you think about that? I, uh, well, I, I I certainly wouldn't. Um, I don't think there's one way of approaching that. Yeah. But um, I I do believe that uh, um, any architecture is built generally within a building context, uh, and whether that's you're working in Los Angeles or you're working in New York or you're working in Zurich, you're working in Sao Paulo, uh, you're working in Beijing. Each of those places has uh, a unique history and um, to the way it builds and, and a, a contemporary context of the way it builds as well. And that, that includes uh, the materials um, that you have at your disposal or at the very least, um, it includes how you might um, use certain materials in those contexts. The most important thing it would seem to me is not so much to concentrate on certain specific materials, um, but to realize that 
that materials and and how you choose them and how you use them are one of the tools in an architect's uh, tool set to express ambitions. And if you can approach as an architect uh, uh, and be very clear about what, what your ambitions are in a project, uh, then the questions around materials and um, uh, what you can, what's available to you and how you, um, what kind of budget you have and, and um, how you start to think about the approach to expressing those ambitions and ideas, then I think it can be more specifically related and tailored to, to the context. But first and foremost, it's about understanding um, and being, I think, very clear about uh, what you're trying to achieve. Um, I mean, it makes it, it makes a whole lot of sense what you're saying, and it seems so consistent with the, the work that you're doing. Um, I'm getting nudged that we um, we should be wrapping up fairly soon. There's so many questions out here. Um, <laughs> we'll have to um, we have to synthesize them. Uh, I think that I think that what um, what I may want to end with here, just looking at a number of these questions and thinking about what, what we've discussed so far. Uh, it seems that a lot of folks are are looking to you, Michael, to think about the future of housing in LA and the future of architecture in LA. Questions um, arising from the uh, the pandemic, sort of you know how we're living post-pandemic, uh, questions about the scale of infrastructure, uh, certainly the, the bridge and these kind of large scale infrastructural work, um, new models of um, new models of living with low income housing in neighborhoods where there's a lot of nimbyism and kind of the work to create uh, more sustainable neighborhoods that that address that. Um, it's there's no way we can get into all of this. But I, I wonder for the students uh, who are really, they're really looking ahead and trying to imagine what what the future of housing and architecture in Los Angeles is going to be? Uh, what what do you see? I mean, what what are what are what are some trends that you see, or what are some some things that you you see taking shape that are going to have a lasting impact in the way we approach this in the dec decades to come? Uh, well, one way is is uh, touching on. Um, a little bit of what we talked about uh, before in terms of the range of scales um, of housing. Um, I think it's incumbent on architects um, to continue to try to keep uh, th that conversation very dynamic, very broad, um, to keep uh, experimenting with the widest range of approaches um, to housing, if if housing in Los Angeles is is successful, it will first and foremost be that we're building enough housing for the people who need it, um, the widest range of people who who need housing in the city. But it'll also be successful if we've continued to allow ourselves to um, uh, to experiment and um, look at. Uh, uh, what a range of different approaches can be to keep that conversation very lively and open. And that's gonna to be tough as, that's gonna be difficult as the pressures to build housing uh, continue to amplify or to mount. Um, people are gonna be looking for a one size fits all solution. And I think the future of this, the successful future of Los Angeles is one in which, um, there's great diversity um, to, to uh, what we do. The second thing I would say is that, um, especially for the students, uh, one of the challenges I think when you're starting your career, starting your work, is that you're both, you're simultaneously, well, you're, 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 you're certainly trying to become as, um, competent and um, 
capable as possible by learning the different techniques of architecture and learning um, how to do architecture um, and to, how to do architecture in the right way. And that's important. I mean, certainly you need to learn um, uh, the widest range of techniques and you need to learn the discipline. But at the same time, I think it, it, it's extremely important to remember that uh, a part of our role is to uh, constantly try to imagine that future, uh, not as a fixed specific thing, but that uh, to continue to keep our conversations about design and what we're doing, uh, to keep an eye on um, the, the reality that what we're making is forecasting uh, is forecasting the future, is, is, is defining the city um, as it's evolving and as it's emerging. Continuing to keep an eye on what the big picture is um, of the city uh, while you're trying to um, literally just make something uh, is difficult, uh, but uh, I think for architecture to continue to have a real role in the conversation around uh, what the city is, for architecture to continue to have a seat at the table in the, the, the discussion of, of what a future is, uh, I would say it's less about, again, trying to define one specific idea about it, um, but uh, continuing to work toward an idea of, of, of just the future period. Wow. That's, that's great. I think that's a great spot to stop. <laughs> that's really, uh, I think very optimistic and uh, I love that. Um, well, I think we do, we do need to wrap up here. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Michael, for, for, chatting with us here and sharing your work. This is just a just a wonderful way to end our lecture series uh, this fall. So Great, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Again, I, I appreciate you having me. Um, and thank you. And, and thank the students uh, uh, for, for terrific questions. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Michael. Um, great conversation. I think um, uh, for various reasons, uh, we all needed and need a shot in the arm of optimism and uh, to be thinking uh, about the future and um, you provided that for us tonight um, on a lot of different levels and uh, uh, the diversity of work and, and what we have to be thinking about in terms of cities like LA is just a perfect uh, laboratory among other cities to, to, to ponder all of this so thank you and we look forward to continuing to connect with you uh, connect you with the school and um, Again, I want to say uh, on behalf of the school, thank you for, for closing out our lecture series. It's been uh, uh, a great experiment, um, and I think with formats and, and a variety of speakers that we've had, it's been great. We've had great conversations, and this is uh, emblematic of, of, um, of how well it's gone, uh, surprisingly in some ways, but how well it's gone uh, this semester. We look forward to, again, connecting with you and all of those who are out there listening. Um, we will be back at it uh, next semester with a full series of public events, and um, you don't have to be affiliated with the school to enjoy these, uh, uh, particularly with the Zoom environment. So please uh, check our website and come back uh, and be with us next semester. So thank you. Have a great day.